no, no, no. Reading the Bible is hard enough, even if you've been reading it for a long time. It's been around for over 2,000 years, and it's pretty easy to see why it would be tricky to read it, especially because the people who are reading it number in the millions and span that entire length of time, which means that there are a lot of people who have different strategies and different approaches, different interpretations, different ways of understanding certain passages. When I was first starting out as a very young Christian, it was really difficult for me to know who to trust when it came to reading the Bible. Whose ideas should I have in mind when I'm going to open up the scriptures and try to learn from them. It was honestly a very difficult time, but thankfully I had uh, brothers and sisters who were more mature than me who had been around for a while and who had done some deep study in the scriptures sort of come alongside me and teach me what they knew. And I've since been able to extend that same courtesy to other people. So with that, I'm going to give you my top 10 tips for both beginners and intermediate and advanced. Honestly, these are just the things you need to know when you're going to open up the Bible. My top 10 tips for how to read the Bible and actually get the value out of it that you hope for. Hey, and welcome back to the channel. My name is Tim. I'm a pastor, author, and entrepreneur. And on this channel, we are learning how to rethink every second of our lives in light of what the Bible really says about eternity. If you want to live your life in constant amazement at God's goodness, his grace, and the beauty of his plans for eternity, then you are in the right place. So go ahead and like the video, hit the subscribe button, ring the notification bell so that you never miss another episode, or you can make me wait until the end of the video to see if I earn it. My first and most important tip is to keep the entire story in mind. This is by far my most important tip. There are 1,189 chapters in your Bible, and there are only four of them where everything is going the way that it should be, the way that it was designed to go. It's the first two chapters and the last two chapters. And in both the beginning and the end, what you have is God's space and human space totally overlapping. Essentially, you're given two chapters at the very beginning to explain the way that the world was supposed to work and supposed to look in the beginning with God and humans occupying the same space. The next chapter, chapter three, this is chapter three of Genesis, describes how the fall happened and that unity was broken. Next comes 1,184 long chapters, including all of human history, describing what it looked like when humanity is trying to get back into God's space, describing God's plan to reunify everything in heaven and on earth in Christ. 99% of your Bible takes place in the part of the story where the job isn't finished, but you need to know what God's goal was for the creation and for humans in the beginning and what the goal is in the end in order to understand what's happening in the meantime. The reunification of heaven and earth is what the Bible is all about about. In Ephesians 1, Paul says that the plan of God for the fullness of time which he set forth and purposed in himself is to unify all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. If we don't have that storyline in mind, whatever page we're on in the Bible, we're going to walk away from it fundamentally confused. My next main tip is to embrace the weird. In the words of the great Dr. Michael Heiser, if it's weird, it's probably important. The Bible is the divinely inspired word of God, and it is absolutely trustworthy and beautiful. It's also really, really bizarre to modern sensibilities. So please go into your scriptural reading knowing that and embracing the weird rather than running from it. There are a lot of sex scandals, brutal stories about murder, stories about slavery, vicious, awful things that humans do to each other. There are long genealogies where such and such person begat so and so, and then they had this child, and then they had this child, and then it's just pages and pages of people's families. Or lots of uh, read the Bible in a year plans get thrown off the minute somebody opens up Leviticus and starts reading about how to properly sacrifice animals. If you're expecting it to all make sense to 21st century Western thinking, then you're going to be disappointed and you're going to be disillusioned and you're going to stop reading pretty quick. Embrace the weird and please commit ahead of time to doing some studying in order to clear up all of the points of confusion. My third most important point is context, context, Context. Once upon a time, I heard someone tell me that the three main rules for understanding and interpreting the Bible are number one, context, number two, context, and number three, context. A great example of this is Philippians 4.13, where Paul says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you take that sentence on face value, it sounds like he's saying, I can do anything that I want and Jesus is going to give me the strength and the power to do it. That's the kind of verse that your Christian high school prints on the banner to put out in front of the home team's tunnel for football games so that the team can run through and cheer and say, we can do it. We can win the game. We can do all things. But if you look at the context, meaning the paragraph where that verse lives and then the page where that 
chapter lives or that page lives. And then the letter itself, the whole letter, Paul is actually saying something very different. He's saying that he can handle both having plenty and having not enough because God will give him the strength to come through. The point is that you can make a Bible verse say anything and you could get it wrong if you're trying to find out what the original author had in mind when he wrote the verse. But that that's much harder to do if you're doing that to a paragraph or to a chapter or to an entire letter. It's very hard to take them out of context if you're including as much context as you can. You can't understand a verse of the Bible in a vacuum. It needs to make sense with what the author's overall point is. My number four tip is don't do it alone, especially if you're a brand new Christian. Find some humble, open minded Christian friends. Talk to them about it. You can even start a conversation by saying, guys, what do you think Paul is saying here in Ephesians 4? And if your friends are smart, they'll pull out their phone and open up their Bible app and start reading it themselves. You've just started a conversation and gotten your friends reading with you at the same time. Win win. Especially when it comes to the letters of the New Testament, these were designed to be read aloud. Even the ancient uh, Old Testament scriptures were designed to be read aloud in front of a big group of people. They were not necessarily designed to be sat down and read one verse at a time and you go really deep on that one verse. That's a totally valid way to read them, but that's not what they were designed to do. They were designed to be read out loud between a group of people and then meditated upon together. So do it the way it was designed to do. As sort of a bonus tip, I would recommend that you find good YouTube channels and other good resources to help you kind of understand what you're reading. For a good variety of perspectives, I recommend The Bible Project, Mike Winger and Alan Parr for YouTube channels. I'll put the links down in the description. They don't all agree, but that's part of what's helpful is that you get a lot of different perspectives. If you want to get really intense, listen to the Bible Project podcast or go and join one of the Bible Project's free classroom classes. Or maybe you should start listening to N.T. Wright or Michael Hyde. They are unimpeachably brilliant Bible scholars who have my full endorsement because they don't get embroiled in all of these weird theological debates. Which brings me to my point number five. Don't get bogged down in systems. It's easy to hear these debates about dispensationalism versus covenant theology, or Calvinism versus Arminianism, or rapture or no rapture. Your job is not to figure out all of today's pastors and how they land and whether any of them is more correct than the other. That's not your job. All of them get some things right and some things wrong. Your job is to figure out what the letter, chapter, or passage in front of you meant to its original audience. If you pick up a system first, like Calvinism, you're bound to misinterpret at least part of what the original author meant when he wrote what he wrote to his original audience. If you're looking for proof of dispensationalism or covenant theology or Calvinism or Arminianism, you're like that person who's not really listening in a conversation. You're just waiting for that thing that you're going to piggyback off of and make your own point. Don't be that person. Point number six, don't treat the Bible like a devotional grab bag. You can't just rip out the most emotional and beautiful sounding verse out of its context, see point number three, and make it your life verse. The Bible wasn't designed to be read that way. What the Bible actually has to say when you give it enough time to speak is more than beautiful enough. You don't need to pick some verse out of context and make that your life verse by saying this is the the... Thing that I'm going to build my life on. Build your life on the whole thing. That's what the Bible's for. Point number seven, don't ignore the Old Testament. It's the backstory of the entire Christian faith. Jesus only means what he means because he's fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. Whenever you hear Jesus call himself the son of man, or he calls himself the son of God, or somebody calls him the Messiah, those things only mean what they mean because they were defined in an Old Testament context. The Old Testament is really strange sometimes, it's difficult to read, it's three quarters of your whole Bible, and I know it's a lot to work, but there's nothing for it. Every single letter of the New Testament makes references to the Old. Paul understands Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. And if you're one of those people that's really interested in trying to understand Revelation, you need to understand that there are hundreds of references on the pages of Revelation to the Old Testament. And if you don't know what those images mean, you're going to have a really hard time. If you're coming from one of these churches where somebody has said that you shouldn't be reading the Old Testament, I understand. They're just wrong on this point. If you're looking for a comfortable entry point, something that's not quite so crazy, you can start with the Psalms and the Proverbs and you're going to have a really good time. Bringing me to my eighth and related point, don't ignore the original languages. Get help with the original languages if you can. You're probably not going to be learning Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic right now, and that's fine. 
Other people have gone ahead of you to do some of that study and they've given you resources. I've already mentioned three people or three groups of people that do this really well. That would be the Bible Project, N.T. Wright, and Michael Heiser. All of them are very focused on the original languages, which is important because if you are reading the Bible and you think that it's in English, a lot of things are going to get lost in translation. Here's a good habit. If you're reading, for instance, Romans 8 and you want to know what the Greek says in the original text, go to Google and type Romans 8 interlinear and you'll get a good result. If you click through, I think it's to Bible Hub. If you click through, you'll be able to see a Greek and English translation together. This tool is going to be a feature in a lot of my future videos when I start to discuss what the original words meant, for instance, soul or spirit. It's going to be a really good time. I recommend it to you highly. Tip number nine, look for design patterns and repeated words. While you're in those original languages, you got to look for the repeated words. If you're a ancient Jewish scholar or author of the Old Testament, then the way that you would emphasize something was often by repeating the words that you were using throughout a chapter or a section of the scriptures. It's not just Hebrew, actually, it's Greek as well. This works in the New Testament as well. When we are reading the scriptures, most of us pick out the verse that makes the most sense to us and think that that's the most important. But sometimes the verse that makes the most sense to a 21st century Westerner is not the point that the author was trying to make. If you're looking for clues as to what the author intends to say as the important part, look for repeated words, look for design patterns, look for stories that sound similar to other stories you've heard before. Here's a hint. Most of those stories are going to be on pages one and two in Genesis. Bringing me to my final tip, number 10, just don't stop. You don't have to load yourself up with this huge charge to be reading the Bible every day and make it this big, scary thing. You want to learn to fall in love with the scriptures, not chain yourself to it out of duty. Remember that it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Don't load yourself up with moral failure if you don't read your Bible today. It's important for you to look at the Bible as the origin story of the kingdom of God and your place in it and to stay curious about it. Read enough to get confused, then stop and check your resources or check your resources first and start reading the Bible with them. This is related to the point I made above. Don't go it alone. It's more helpful if you have people traveling with you than if you're going to try to do it by yourself. Let me tie a few of these points together actually into a funny story. You might be wondering, why was I eating paper at the beginning of this video? Well, Psalm 1 says that blessed is he who meditates on God's law day and night. The Hebrew word that we've translated meditates is actually the Hebrew word haga. Haga means to chew on something. The author is saying that you're going to be like a bear over there in the corner chewing on something and muttering the words aloud to yourself. It's going to sound like you're chewing on, the, on God's word on the law. So you need to be willing to chew on God's word if you really want to get the juice out of it. Only you should probably be using your brain to chew on it rather than this weirdo who was chewing on the actual paper. So that's it. Those are my 10 tips. As always, give it a like, subscribe, ring the bell. You'll see everything I make and more. Whenever I go live with another video, you'll see it. And as always, if you're trying to go deeper, you can always go to my website at theoverlap.life. You can grab a copy of my book or check out our other resources if you're curious about going deeper into the scriptures. Right now, if you're interested in learning more about eternity the way that I was talking about it at the beginning of this video, I've got a video right over here where I'm talking about the three best books that I have ever read about eternity. And I think it would be a huge blessing to you. Further up and further in. Thanks for watching.